We have with us today Chris Freund from Nikon Capital, the founder of uh, Nikon Capital. Welcome here to London Business School. Uh, the occasion is that he's here on a trip with one of his portfolio companies and I thought it would be uh, a good opportunity to pick up and see where we are with Mekong three years later since we visited Vietnam and wrote the case. So uh, he agreed to, again, much appreciate. Could you say why, why exactly are you here with whom? What is the occasion? Yes, uh, I'm here with the senior management of Mobile World, which is our mobile phone retail chain. It's also been our most successful investment. Uh, and we're visiting a lot of UK-based retailers or service providers to retailers uh, as an opportunity for Mobile World to learn from those companies. So we spent the first two days with Carphone Warehouse, and they were very open and was very useful. And then we spent a half day with Google and learned about omni-channel retailing and how to integrate online and offline. Uh, and we spent um, a half day with John Lewis and we also met some IT-related professionals to learn about uh, the kind of IT infrastructure that's necessary for Mobile World to get to the next level. That sounds to me new because I don't re recall that from uh, when visiting there. And the big issue that at that time caught my eye was the HR, the profile of, uh, of the people that is relatively young, come with uh, operational experience on the ground, uh, as deal partners and working working with the uh, portfolio companies. Uh, it seems like you're using now a slightly different model, right? Well, we're still doing coaching, but the coaching alone is not enough. And I think one of the things we realized over the last few years is that we're not the leading experts in any particular domain. So if, it, if you're talking about mobile phone retail, there's someone who knows more than us. So for example, a car phone warehouse is better at that than Mekong Capital. Uh, and it's like that really in any field or dimension in which our companies operate. So while we still do the coaching, uh, we, we've added this new element, which is about getting the companies to learn best practices. And it, and it really materializes in two ways. Uh, one is getting outside consultants. So sometimes it's corporate, like, like strategy consulting firms. Sometimes it's individuals, like former CEOs of global companies. Uh, and it also involves a lot of sharing uh, opportunities where we can put the management of our companies together with similar companies, kind of like how the Mobile World Management met with Carphone Warehouse Management, and they can learn a lot from that. And we've, we've had good successes doing that with other companies as well. So like our, um, our restaurant group, uh, Golden Gate, uh, they, they've recently went to the U.S. and spent a few days with a Chicago-based restaurant group called Let Us Entertain You and that was very productive. And last week they went to Hong Kong and spent a few days meeting a Hong Kong-based group called Maxims. And I think you know, they can learn a lot from that, which is something separate from what Mekong Capital directly provides. Uh, there are indeed there are two companies that have been profiled in the case, AA and ICP. Uh, and both of them you exited since the time of the case. Uh, I must say that both of them, uh, you made money, but uh, it was not very significant. And uh, in one case, uh, it was two million. The other one, it was also two X. Mm -hmm. And uh, frankly, the expectation that I had from ICP, at least, as fast-moving consumer good, one of the, you know, I thought this would be a home run. Mm -hmm. And in a way, maybe you missed a trick here, right? I mean, what, uh, what has relatively gone wrong here in terms of the potential? So, yeah, in the case of ICP, uh, I think it's probably true that we sold too early. Uh, for the first uh, few years of the investment, the revenues were growing very well, but the profit was very flat. And I believe that what was missing was the granularity of the KPIs and really tracking KPIs throughout the organization and really using that as a management tool. And we worked with them to roll that out um, starting around one year before our exit. And it seems that that initiative really had a big impact in ICP, uh, but w we probably sold too early to see all the benefit of that. So the, the new buyer, which is an Indian company called Merico, after they bought it, the company did continue to perform very well. So, so probably had we stayed in longer, we would have seen more upside. Um, so I think perhaps we did sell too early. And, and there's been a few cases like that where we, um, I think, of course, as a private equity firm, we are under pressure from our LPs to have divestments. That's sure. 
part of the nature of private equity? Private equity is transitional capital, and uh, there is a limit to how much you can hold it. Uh, the, which brings me actually to another element that is kind of unique, I would say, is the, your investment in the Vietnam Azilia Fund, mm -hmm. uh, which is listed companies. I understood the original model that was to invest in pre-IPO. Uh, to what extent uh, this is successful and or important in, in, in your portfolio of activities? Well, there's one, one element of it that's gone very well and one that's not gone well. Uh, what didn't go well is that we overpaid for our original investments. So the fund was launched in 2007, and that was the peak of the market. You could, um, you could say that there was a bubble happening at that time. Now, at the time, we were getting into these pre-IPO deals at about half of the PE ratio that we expected they would list at. But this was a time where the public equity PE ratios were around 30 to 35. We were getting into deals at PE ratios of say 15 to 17, so it seemed like a big discount. Uh, but what we didn't anticipate was that the market would come crashing down to a point where at one point the median PEs were about four or five. Oh it's gone up a bit more, so the median now is you know, probably around seven or so, so it's recovered but n nowhere near where it was in 2007. Um, so I think that was the, the, the flawed part, was that we pursued this strategy where we, in absolute terms, where we essentially overpaid on the valuation. Uh, on the positive side, we did choose well-managed companies that were pretty easy to work with. And so we've, we've had some really good successes in terms of how we've um, interacted with the companies. Uh, we've been equally involved, with the exception of one company, which is called FPT, which is an IT company. All the other companies in the portfolio, we have equal level of involvement uh, as the unlisted companies in our other funds. Uh, and um, yeah, they've been easy to work with. And in fact, one of the companies called Trafaco, I think is really emerging as a big success story. Uh, when we invested, it was the fifth largest pharmaceutical company in Vietnam. Now it's the second largest. So it's been growing faster than its peers. And um, they've been, they're a former state-owned company, but they've been very easy to work with. Uh, we, we got them to create a, a, a vision that they're excited about, create a business plan, implement management reporting, KPIs. Uh, they had, initially, they had some kind of um, conflicts of interest in terms of their corporate governance structure, but we've got them to clean up almost all of it. And the final remaining piece should be cleaned up within the next few months. Uh, that's, so, yeah. that's amazing. Doing private equity for listed companies, that's the best. I would like to finish with one more question, more holistic. And uh, you have been the first Vietnamese dedicated fund on the ground over there now for about uh, some 12 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, to what extent this does generate for you tangible advantage, whether this is in deal sourcing and in terms of access to uh, to people, uh, to what extent has this materialized? Well, for sure we had an early mover advantage. So we were about five years before the next real private equity fund was set up for Vietnam. So we essentially had a five-year head start. And I think for the most part, we, we blew it. Like we, we missed the opportunity. Uh, the, the positive thing I would say is that we it was an opportunity to learn. Our first fund was very small, mostly development finance institutions who, who aren't as commercially oriented as, as regular private equity LPs. Um, and so we, we made a lot of mistakes or had a lot of lessons learned in our first fund. And we certainly learned from them. So I think that's very clear that we really improved our whole approach and you know we um, learned from that. But what we didn't, um, we didn't really benefit, other than the learning opportunity, we didn't really use that five-year head start to successfully you know, build a, a track record or, or, or make real achievements. But was it because of turnover of employees? Or, or yeah, that was one, I think, you know, one element of, of one major uh, uh, flaw in my original approach was that I was focusing too much on having a local team and therefore basically hiring junior people because there were no experienced private equity professionals in Vietnam. So, but I thought it's so important to have a local team so I recruited essentially all junior people, or you know, maybe people would say five or eight years work experience, but in private equity, they're essentially entry level. 
And I thought by providing enough training and career development that they would eventually move up and you know, within say five years we'd have a senior team. But it didn't really work out that way. And now I realize that we need a balance. You know, instead of having lots of junior people and kind of trying to move them up, you know, we need a balance between you know, senior, middle, and junior. And what about international balance? Would you, again, it was primarily Vietnamese, kind yeah. of making sense, but yeah. maybe they were not exposed mm. to the whole world mm. before. Exactly, yeah. That's another one of our lessons, is we need to recruit whoever is most qualified for that position and not give preference to local candidates. So if a Vietnamese is the best person, then that's great, of course. But, but, if, but if, you know, if we're looking, say, for a partner, and if we can find somebody who's better, who, who's not Vietnamese, sure. then we should certainly get the person who's better. Of course, some, some positions will require ability to speak Vietnamese, and of course, for those, it's most likely that we'll need to get a Vietnamese candidate. But in retrospect, I really think you need a balance between overseas talent and, and local, and I think it's a mistake to do too extreme either way. So, so that's kind of what we're going for now, is, is the balance between the two. Thank you very much for coming, mm -hmm. uh, and we will watch you in the next fundraising uh, that you do. Good. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks. Pleasure.